Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham, and this is Biochemistry One. The, the title of this topic, this theory video, is Integration of Metabolism One. It's the first of uh, uh, two um, theory segments that will um, address this sort of large global uh, topic. <clears throat> Remember what we said uh, at, in, in the last seg uh, theory uh, lecture segment. We're, we've, we're now zooming back. We've spent the entire semester looking at the details of individual biochemical reactions at the at, literally at the molecular level, a little bit at the cellular or subcellular level. We're now zooming back to look at integration at the cellular level, but also uh, integration at the systems level. That is, how a body, like a human body, uh, coordinates its biochemistry in order to survive and function. So let's look at uh, control of glycogen metabolism by phosphorylation. So we, we, we just introduced this topic right at the end of the last segment as we were beginning to zoom back. We're now going to look more carefully and in more detail at this uh, topic. Let's put it in perspective and then let's talk about why we're focused on it. So here are the two sets of reactions that control the flux, the, the, the um, cycling between glycogen and uh, glucose in the uh, G6P form that's available for uh, glycolysis or um, um, the um, pentose phosphate pathway, for example. So with this... Um, Cycle, this substrate cycling system, what you really want to do, just as we were looking at, for example, in the case of cycling between uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and fructose 6-phosphate, for example, in control of glycolysis, you want to push it in one direction or the other. That is, you want to push it either toward synthesis or toward degradation. And we're going to look at that process. We've already looked at allosteric modifiers. Remember that uh, G6P both activates... Uh, synthesis, as you accumulate uh, extra glucose in this uh, usable form, and it uh, inhibits further degradation of glycolysis. Makes sense, right? If you have uh, plenty of glucose to run uh, metabolism, so you're starting to accumulate G6P, you want to stop making glucose, and you want to start storing glucose in glycogen. So it makes perfect teleological sense. And likewise, uh, AMP, uh, a, the, the very sensitive indicator of ATP levels, as we've talked about before, and we'll return to again. Remember, adenylate kinase takes two ADPs, and makes an ATP and an AMP. And because of the relative concentrations of these uh, actors uh, under physiological conditions and the equilibrium constant, small changes in ATP produce large changes in AMP. And those large changes in AMP are the, are the thing that various uh, processes, including this one, are going to monitor. We'll see other examples of processes that monitor the AMP concentration as a uh, an inverse proxy, so to speak, of ATP uh, uh, status. So, uh, a little bit of elevation in ATP uh, uh, means that you you need more more ATP synthesis, and so ATP is going to drive the degradation of glycolysis into glucose for glycolysis and the citric acid cycle all makes sense. What we want to look at today in the next segment, though, much more than allosteric regulation, is regulation by post-translation modification, regulation by phosphorylation. What we'll see in general is that glycogen phosphorylase is activated by phosphorylation, and glycogen synthase on the right-hand side is inhibited by phosphorylation. In fact, in, uh, by phosphorylation by some of the same kinases, the enzymes that phosphorylate proteins. So if you come in and activate those kinases, you are upregulating glycogen degradation and simultaneously downregulating glycogen synthesis. So you're creating this uh, flux in one direction, uh, the, the desired direction. As we'll see, these, uh, these kinases, these uh, phosphorylation events, are both triggered by low energy status. Makes perfect sense. If, you, if you're starting to, uh, if you have a little bit, uh, uh, if you have not enough energy, what do you want to do? You want to hydrolyze some uh, glycolysis by activating the synthase. And at the same time, you don't want to use the glucose that you're about to use to make ATP. You don't want to push it back into glycogen. And so you're simultaneously going to inhibit the synthase and activate the uh, phosphorylase uh, to, to in under low energy conditions. So we'll look at the logic of phosphorylation and notice what we're doing here. We're going to, we're, we've, we're taking the biochemical reactions, these specific enzymatic reactions, and we're stepping back a step and looking at how they're coordinated first at the cellular level and ultimately then at the, at the, at the level of the body, at the system or, organ, or an organismic level. Okay. So let's, let's focus on glycogen phosphorylase. And we, do, we focus on glycogen, uh, both glycogen phosphorylase and synthase, 
partly because they're so central to energy metabolism. They, they are the, the things that control the, the uh, uh, incorporation of glucose and its storage in glycogen for future use or release of uh, uh, glucose from glycogen, in the case of liver, all the way to glucose and into the circulatory system in response to need. Uh, so it's, it's central. But it's also the case that because this is so central, these enzymes are very abundant. They're easy to uh, purify and work with, and uh, the byproducts of all the animal flesh we eat are nice things like liver, uh, for example, where we can get phenomenal uh, amounts of these enzymes to work with experimentally over the last century, and so we understand them really well. So we're looking at them because they're important and we understand them well, but also because they are a proxy for a lot of other regulatory processes. So when you go on to take advanced physiology courses or cell biology courses, you look at many other signaling systems that are going to involve kinases, are going to involve phosphorylation. Understanding this particular system here and now helps us not just appreciate the logic of control of metabolism, but positions you to be comfortable with uh, other uh, more complex systems that you'll encounter in, in other courses. All right. So let's begin and fill this picture in. So look at glyco glycogen phosphorylase. And what's called the A form is the active form, and what's called the B form is the inactive form uh, in the lower uh, right of this uh, image. And notice what interconverts them. So the active form, the A form, is created by a phosphorylation event. And ATP is burned to put a phosphate onto that enzyme and activate it. As we'll see over the next few minutes, sometimes some enzymes are activated by phosphorylation, some are inactivated by phosphorylation. It's all a question of the logic of the local circuit. So, so uh, there are all kind of, you can activate a single kinase, and that kinase can turn on one enzyme and turn off another enzyme. So you get very sophisticated control uh, in this way. By activating, by, by activating kinases that will run around and look at uh, target-specific uh, proteins. Okay, So this is the active form, and it is produced by an enzyme called phosphorylase kinase. So the, the, the circuitry here can get just a little confusing and intimidating, like a subway map, for example. But like a subway map, once you get the control of it, it and once you understand it, it's, it's straightforward. So the anchor here is to remember that the phosphorylated form of phosphorylase <laughs> is uh, active. Right? It's a little confusing. The phosphorylated form of phosphorylase is active. So you have to remember that. And as we'll see, the active form of phosphorylase kinase that puts the phosphate onto phosphorylase is also phosphorylated. So we'll, let's uh, peel that back. Let's look first, though, at the second half of this at the bottom, the fact that the uh, enzyme that takes the phosphate back off of phosphorylase A form, converting it back into the B form, is a phosphorylase called uh, phosphoprotein phosphatase 1. And we're going to look at its control in a moment. Before we move on, though, let me emphasize that when uh, pho uh, f glycogen phosphorylase is phosphorylated and is the A form, it is uh, very sensitive to allosteric activators. And when it's in the inactive B form, it's very sensitive to allosteric uh, inhibitors. So what you have is a combinatorial synergistic interaction between the phosphorylation events that we're focused on here and the allosteric modifiers that we talked about in the previous segment. So you get a very nice, the, the gist of this is you're going to get a very nice on-off switch where you can either flood um, uh, metabolic flow from glycogen to glucose or backwards from glucose back up to glycogen depending upon the need uh, uh, for energy or not. Okay. All right, so let's look at this phosph protein phosphatase, this phosphoprotein phosphatase 1, and how it's regulated. It's a slightly complex uh, story, as you'll see, and we're going to symbolize the PP1C, the uh, phosphoprotein uh, phosphatase 1C isoform, uh, by a circle here in the next diagram. Do you see the two circles there? And we're going we're to look at when that phosphatase gets activated. And when it's active, it decreases the phosphorylation, pulls phosphates off of uh, glycogen phosphorylase, which will do what? Will inactivate glycogen phosphorylase and will decrease glycogen degradation, allowing increased glycogen synthesis. Conversely, when it is inactive, as at the bottom, it will uh, allow uh, the kinases to uh, phosphorylate the, the uh, uh, glycogen phosphorylase more heavily, more heavily activating the enzyme, uh, increasing glycogen degradation. So this is a very general...